Fire Radio. This episode's brought to you by Notorious Fire Company. Firefighter owned and operated Notorious Fire Company manufactures and creates quirky and unique items for the fire service. Whether it's your stainless steel water bottles, tumblers, four-in-one koozies, you can decorate your emotional support water bottle with more than 100 different designs. They offer so very much from apparel to swag to stickers. They got you covered. Check them out at NotoriousFire.com. That's N-O-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, NotoriousFire.com. And check them out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at NotoriousFire. And this month with the podcast, if you use coupon code Fire Radio June 2023. That is Fire Radio June 2023. You'll get free shipping on all orders within the U.S. So check them out, NotoriousFire.com. Lenny and the crew, they're making great stuff. And I have to tell you, with the summer upon us, the sticker packs are out of control. You got everything from Star Wars to pinups and everything in between. Slap them on your beer fridges, your coolers, and your tumblers and celebrate the summer in style with Notorious Fire. A good supporter and longtime friend. We're happy to have him on the podcast with us. Check him out, NotoriousFire.com and coupon code Fire Radio June 2023 for free shipping all across the U.S. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 28 of the Size Up by National Fire Radio. And as I kind of say every week, I still can't believe I'm here continuing to do this week after week. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, not listening in your car or out for your run or anything, you, you'll you notice something different about me on this episode that I have now have a clean face again. My, my mustache has gone away, uh, much to the sadness of my friend Griff over at... Uh, uh, stash salt there, but uh, Mrs. Pip is quite happy that I am back to, uh, I guess, a baby-faced Pip, as my boys call me. Um, so now, instead of being their dad, I'm their brother again when I go pick them up somewhere, because we're all almost the same height, so it, it works out anyway. But anyhow, enough about me. I want to get uh, on with our amazing guest here today, and I'm so stoked that he was able to join me, because this guy is a business owner, a husband, a dad, a DJ, a Burning Man participant, uh, overall health guy. I'm not going to call him a guru because I'll be like, Pip, I'm not a guru. But my good friend Aaron Hyde from Life Aid Beverage. What is up, buddy? What's up, bud? You had a mustache. I missed that uh, that part of it. I'll have to go back to an old episode and check it out. <laughs> I, dude, I had a full on like the fireman curl, like uh, like Luigi mustache looking almost, I guess is, is a good way to put it. We well, your haircut hasn't changed since I saw you last, so. That's this consistent. is true. My my haircut has stayed consistent since uh since actually like my since we met. So it was funny because you know I was I asked you to come on and I was super stoked and I'm like man when did Aaron and I meet? It was ten years ago and we were both on a podcast together as guests. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, about so, a dec yeah a decade ago. Yeah, it was crazy. It was a fire. I, I think your faux hawk actually motivated me. I I get a faux hawk every you know couple of years or so. So <laughs> thank you for that. No problem, man. I, I, that's amazing because, you know, usually when a I, I get that comment, it's from a parent who's like, you know, my nine year old saw you with your husband. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. It, it's good to know that, that there's another adult out there. It's like, nah, man, you did it. So I had to do it. So it's always yeah. a win. Um, but for the folks out here that don't, you know, know much about you or like, where, where, where do you bring this guy in? You know, you are one of the founders and co-owners of Life Aid Beverage Company, which has just skyrocketed in the 10 years since I've known you. But can, you know, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background and, and how kind of Life Aid came around. Yeah, I'm um, the you know, present co-founder of Life Aid. Most people know us by Fit Aid, which is our you know, sports recovery beverage line. We also have fitted uh, energy now, our clean energy line. And um, we've been around for 12 years now, believe it or not. It's crazy. Um, Unreal. It started with Golfer Aid, right? Golfer Aid was the first, if I'm remembering. Yeah, our first concept was actually Party Aid. Uh, Golfer Aid was our first product and Fit Aid was the first product that, that really sold well. Uh, but we launched all three of those within six months of each other, which you should never do. Stupid idea, but live and learn. It's a great uh, idea, right? man. Launch them all at yeah. once, see what happens. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, basically, we wanted to create, you know, clean products around our personal lifestyle. You know, I was a sports chiropractor at the time. Um, my business partner, Ryan, was a certified financial planner. We both had very young kids. Mine were uh, five and three, you know, at the time. And, and working on with high-level athletes, coming into the office and, and watching them drink the energy drinks, I was like, dude, you're a Ferrari and you're putting 87 gasoline in it. Like, you know, just a bad idea. But there was nothing really to point them to. I mean, at the time, you know, energy drinks, the big three were, were dominating the, the market. And then you had some emerging health brands like kombucha and, and coconut water, but those had very uh, acquired tastes, I, I guess you could say. Nice and, uh, you know, they were pretty hippy dippy at the time. So, you know, it was really out of ignorance and passion that we, we created uh, a lifestyle beverage brand that, that, you know, had really certain pillars that no one had done before, all natural, so no sucralose, which we now see more and more studies, you know, sucralose is killing your gut microbiome, a lot of other, you know, nasty uh, uh, things happening, you know, with, with sucralose consumption, As, no aspartame, which was very popular, you know, at the time, now that it looks like the EU may, may label aspartame as carcinogenic, which I, you know, should have been a long time ago, you know, none of the artificial dyes, you know, low sugar, clean or on our caffeinated line, clean caffeine from green tea versus synthetic caffeine that comes from these gigafactories in China with no regulation. And so just doing things differently, doing things differently, being function forward instead of, you know, having 20 different flavors of the same skew, uh, having blends specific for use occasions, you know, so after you get done, you know, out, uh, work in the, the, the fire truck and, you know, out there hustling all day, your body's depleted. So, you know, Fit Aid, it can be a go-to option that you can feel good about that, you know, helps bring you back to life. You know, it's got a lot of different recovery aspects to, to it. You know, Party Aid is our kind of our Burning Man recovery beverage. We have Focus Aid, which is our nootropic drink for, for brain health and Focus Immunity Aid for, you know, immune, et cetera. It's just so awesome too, because, you know, when, when, again, when we first met and you had those, that big three energy drink time, you know, I feel like since then, in those 10 years, energy drinks are still just as popular as they were. It's almost like they're just rebranding under a new name or a fancier bottle, but inside of that can or bottle is all the same crap for lack of a better term. Correct. You're a hundred percent accurate with that. And I wish more people would turn over and look at the label because we had like energy 1.0 when you and I first met, right. Which was the big three, uh, Red Bull monster rock star. And then, um, shortly after that, you had what I call energy 2.0, uh, beginning with bang, you know, bang came on the scene, supposedly had creatine in it. We now know it didn't have creatine. That's why the company went bankrupt. Uh, they were lying to consumers, but uh, supposedly had creatine in it and created this perform what we call performance energy category, right? So it's like energy with benefits, so to speak. And you've got a lot of players in there right now that are having massive numbers, starting with Bang, Celsius is probably the most well-known, you know, right now. A lot of women drinking Celsius. What they don't know is Celsius is sweetened with sucralose, just like the traditional energy drinks, as you as you astutely mentioned there. Um, but there's others in there, you know, Ghost, Buck Up, Alani News, another, you know, female-centric one that's artificially sweetened. So those are, you know, energy 2.0. So it's like some functionality associated with energy. What I call what we've done with Fit8 Energy, you know, our, our clean energy lines, really energy 3.0 or the evolution of the category. Where does the category really go? Well, you know, health conscious consumers care what they put in their body. They understand that what they put in their body directly reflects in how they perform, how they function, you know, how they show up in life. And, uh, and there's going to be another level of transparency where people do turn around the back of that can and go, wait a second, I thought this thing was healthy, but, you know, it's artificially sweetened or it has synthetic caffeine or it's loaded with sugar or sodium, whatever, what have you. And, and so as that happens, you know, I think that natural evolution brings people to wanting a solution that is fully transparent, that is clean, that's naturally sweetened, that has clean caffeine, et cetera. Now, as you're like, you're mentioning this natural evolution, because even I know for me, you know, I'm not reading every can of everything I'm drinking. Occasionally I am, let's say, but even when I look at the consumer market, 
um, when it comes to like fast foods or places that were forced to put the calorie count on their menu, you know, are you starting to see that in your industry too, where now that the ingredients are becoming more pronounced or, or, or something like people are starting to realize what's really in these drinks, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, I realize that, you know, there's some dishes that I would order on the regular that now I look and I'm like, this has got 1400 calories in it. I probably shouldn't be eating this right now type of a thing. Yeah, I think, you know, people in general are getting more educated. I mean, think about when we were kids, right? Like what, what was going on when we were kids? There was still asbestos everywhere in, in, in ceilings, right? Like there was still lead in paint, you know? I mean, it, you, you say that now and you kind of chuckle because it's like, well, that would be ridiculous if someone was putting out a product like that. But I believe, I truly believe that 20 years from now, we'll look back at it and look at like the artificial sweeteners, synthetic caffeine, you know, these crazy amounts of sugar that people are loading in, into things and go, oh my God, that, that was the modern day asbestos. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, my kids barely like soda for my kids is a treat. And what my kids think is a soda is like a Sprite or a ginger ale, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, yeah. Because it's just not what they're drinking. You know, they're drinking things like Fit Aid or they're drinking water, 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 water through their life. But, you know, yeah. it's just such a difference where, you know, even when you look at seatbelts, that evolution of seatbelts, when we were kids, there there were no seatbelts, you know. I this was, was the seatbelt, the, the mom's yeah. hand going across your chest, right? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to karate chop one. you in the chest, and hopefully I hit your chest yeah. and not your neck yeah. where I take you out. <laughs> That's going to do a lot of good on a head-on, just <laughs> use the arm. It's a <laughs> Great leverage <laughs> there. <laughs> like really quick, like just whop, whop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how quick their reactions were though those moms man. They, yeah, they definitely moved they're, they were definitely they moved. were moved yeah they, yeah they knew what was up it was like a natural thing like just that natural yeah. mom reaction where the hand came the, mo over. the mother airbag there yeah. <laughs> it, but we've seen that evolution you know even with airbags too you know and being oh. in the emergency services um and kind of knowing that evolution in the beginning airbags were hurting people because of the rate that they were coming out and in fact, people weren't wearing their seatbelts. What we've learned on that end is that if you have your seatbelt on and the airbag deploys, the seatbelt pulls you back into the seat. So the airbag is more of that pillow and not whacking you. Right. Um, and that's how we're evolving. Again, going back to the, the beverage industry and the, the health food industry, you know way more about it than I do, but I feel like we're getting there just a lot slower. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we it's slow, but it is progress you know it's movement in the right direction and and one of my core pillars i you know i'm sure we've talked about in the past is is focusing on uh, trajectory not velocity meaning focusing on the direction that we're going not how quickly we're getting there and this can be applied to all aspects of, of life but especially you know the younger generation tends to flip that and, and really focus on how quickly everything's happening you know for them or to them instead of doing the right things over time. And as long as we're continuing to do the right things over time and moving forward, that velocity will, will eventually catch up. But, you know, right now, you know, and, and always in life, focusing on trajectory first and foremost, you know, are we doing the right things consistently over time? And I look at food and beverage and it is going the right direction. I mean, do we still have, you know, uh, massive chronic disease problem in this country yes we do is inflammation chronic inflammation still a very big problem caused by you know high sugar diets lack of exercise uh inflammatory you know uh, uh seed oils um you know all types of artificial ingredients that we're, we're putting into our body you know absolutely it is you know so, so overall i think the consciousness of, of what's going on is going in the right direction the results have yet to catch up you know some of those results are, are still going in the wrong direction i, I think on the coast you know we've, we've mostly woken up and 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 uh, we just need to can you know that'll that'll work its way uh, inland and into middle America and, and, you know, more and more people. And especially in, you know, the fire industry, it's like, you probably have some pretty big extremes, you know, it's like most firefighters need to be physically fit in order to perform the job to the level that it demands. But you also have people out there that, you know, are probably dropping dead of heart attacks because they're not paying attention to their health. They're chugging, you know, three or four, energy drinks full of you know, artificial ingredients and high sugar and synthetic caffeine a day and then going out and putting their body through you know extreme you know uh, exhaustion and temperatures and and, and physical um, uh, all, uh, 
everything, everything, everything they're we do, doing. Yeah, everything yeah, we do. Yeah, everything, everything you're doing yeah. on a daily basis is put is putting the body into the red. It's like, come on, you know, you gotta you you, you can't be putting the body into the red and have a baseline uh, of nutrition and fuel that can't that's not supporting that in in the best way possible. And it's the same with that too. Like we're we're learning these things, right? We've always done it and we've always seen it as being an extreme. But now we're learning again what these extremes really do to our body and our body over time because we're paying attention to it, you know. And by knowing that fueling of what you're putting in and what you're putting out, you know, when when we have a fire, at least I know for for myself and and most of the people around me, we just work. I don't really think about what I'm doing. I'm just working, and that work yeah. is really really hard at a lot of times. Um, and I need to be prepared for it. And probably, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when I started this thing, well, when I started it a long, a long time before that, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just thinking like, ah, I'm going to a fire, this is going to be great. And we're going to put the fire out and we're going to leave. Whereas now, um, everyone is thinking about that. And I'm teaching my rookies things about their fueling and about what they need to be doing at work. I mean, there were, I think, part of the problem, I have an older firehouse and uh, there's not a lot of room in it. And now the bigger gallon water jugs that just keep appearing every time we hire guys, they walk in with them. They're everywhere. Like you trip over these things, which is a great mm -hmm. thing. But again, it's, it's that education curve. And I love that trajectory over velocity because I do think in the fire service, in the emergency services as a whole, we're always continuing to learn. And it is a slow progress of how we're going, but it's better than just jumping right into it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. When I was a volunteer firefighter, you know, 20 years ago, you know, it was all about teaching us how to do the thing. There was no uh, education around, you know, high, I mean, maybe very little around, you know, hydration and, and fuel. And, it was you know, called hey, drink water. Have a call. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There was a, like, a pee chart in the bathroom. If you were lucky, <laughs> yeah, there exactly. may have been a pee chart to say which color your pee was 20 something years ago. Right. Right. You know, so, you know, it, we are moving slowly in the right directions. There is hope. There's there, there definitely is. And you you can't, again, you can never give up on hope. But I, I just, again, I like that, that your trajectory. And then when I think about, you know, our friendship over these, these 10 years and watching Life Aid grow, you know, it's been that slow progress. You know, you weren't like, we're going to be on every store shelf tomorrow. It started right. with a couple stores and uh, airports, I think. And, you know, seeing you guys on the first shelf, I remember sending you a picture from New Jersey to be like, yo, you're in my local pharmacy, man. But yeah. that trajectory is is how everything in life should be. Anything worthwhile, right? Anything yeah. worthwhile. If we get, if we just arrive wherever we perceive, you know, perceive that end point is, you know, we all set goals. Hopefully we're setting, you know, goals for ourselves, for our lives, relationships and that kind of thing. And I, you know, I, the more mature we get, the older I get, I'm coming up on my 48th birthday already here in a couple of days. It's like, yeah, it's, it's not, you know, when, when we, it's great to achieve goals. Don't get me wrong. But when we get there, you're kind of like, okay, this is nice, you know, but now what's, what's the next thing? What am I driving for next? So it's not really crossing the finish line. It's, it's, that process that we're going through, right? What is the skill set that I've developed? What is the discipline that, I, that I've instilled in my life? You said preparedness for the fire. Well, what does that preparedness look like? You know, I, we haven't talked about this in a while, but I know you work out like a maniac. I know your nutrition's good. It wouldn't surprise me at all if you did things like cold plunge and saunas and that type of thing to expose the body to the kind of these extreme environments and, and not lose your shit, not lose your cold, cool when you're going in freezing cold water, or you're, you know, getting your body temperature up in a, in a sauna. Why? Because those type of environments help mimic what you're going to experience when you're out there, you know, fighting a blazing fire, you need to rescue some lives or people's lives are dependent upon you. Yeah, it's definitely a part of my life. I need to get back into the cold plunge thing. I know it's like the, it's been the fitness trend recently. So I've kind of been like, I'm not going to get trendy. And I keep getting the hit up for the ad for like the super cheap plunge tub. I'm like, oh, yeah. man, I think I think I'm gonna have to go for it now. You know, I think and especially now here in Jersey, it's we're like going to be 100 and cooking today yeah. or something like that. Like it's going to be disastrous. But those types of extremes, it's just important for me, like you had said, you know, you reach that goal and you continue on to the next one. 
And what I like to always remind myself when I reach a goal is to keep the lessons that I've learned 10, 15 years ago, five years ago, and apply them to getting to my next goal, because that's how we become successful, right? Is we learn these things and we have to keep moving them forward. So whether it be a promotion, whether it be uh, whatever else I've said, doing this podcast. And like I even had said to you before, like, I really have to get better at my editing. And everyone that listens to it is like, listens is like, yeah, you have to get better at your editing for, for clipping things. And I'm learning that and moving it forward. But it's just about moving forward. Again, trajectory over velocity may be my new mantra for a while. Putting in the reps. I mean, you look at the most successful YouTuber of all time, Mr. Beast, you know, and he talks about like, look at my very first videos. They completely suck. So, you know, it's not like I was good at this just out of the gate, you know, and now he's, you know, he's a young guy worth multiple billions of dollars. Why? Because he put in the reps. Yeah. You know, he's just been in the game longer. Uh, you, you look at uh, Warren Buffett. Everyone's like, oh, Warren Buffett, the, the best investor that's ever lived. Is he? He's just been in the game longer. He's just been in the game longer. If you look at his whole thing about compounding interest, the fucker's, you know, 90 something years old. He's been, and he started when he was, I think, uh, 12 or 14 years old. He's been in the game a long time and apply the principles over time. You know, so talk about, you know, really focusing on, on trajectory over velocity, you know, staying in the game and being consistent. Most people, they start something and they suck at it. We all suck at it every, the first time we do it. Very rarely do you have, you know, someone who's just completely natural and, and crushes uh, any sport or whatever the first time they do it. It's almost unheard of, right? But it's that consistency over time instead of giving up after one try or one week or one month. You know, little incremental changes. If I get 1% better at something, 1% in a week's time, which is pretty achievable for anything, think about how much better you are after a year, 10 years, 20 years, right? It's, it's you know, you'll be, you you'll be in that mastery level. Yeah, and that's keep really, going. just keep going and going and going. Even when you get to that master level, Warren Buffett still hasn't stopped, I don't believe. You know what I mean? He's still going and trying to, yeah. to do things you know, maybe not to the level he was when he was younger, but he's still moving forward. And it, it's just such a big thing to do, uh, whether it be fitness, personal, you know, it's just like you and I have talked a lot in the past about marriages and things. And like, that is the, I think it's the hardest job I have is being married. <laughs> when it comes yeah, to look, I mean, being a, a man and being a good, you know, being a good husband, being a father, you know, being a provider, like we, we're under we're underrated. I mean, being a, a man, being a real man has been a little bit demonized, I think, uh, by the media over the years. And and this whole thing about toxic masculinity, toxic mascu toxic men, toxic masculinity is all around the beta males. You know, we saw toxic masculinity during covid because you had beta males now that were given power you know, given, given a lot of power over other people. The alpha males out there aren't toxic masculine toxic at all the alpha males are the ones that that still you know open doors that are still you know kind and courteous they're they're they're, they're they treat their families well you know and they and they get out and do the work without complaining you know that's the alpha males you know the toxic males are the beta males and you got that that alpha kind of like you're saying like the the misnomer of like it's the loudest guy you know what I mean? Like oh, you're alpha because you're so loud and you're so in everybody's face and you do this. And it's probably not what it's about. It's about what you just said. It's opening the doors for people. It's picking something up when someone dropped it. It's saying please and thank you. You know, Absolutely. all of these things that we've, I don't want to say as a society, because again, I feel like it, it just depends on how you look at it and who you're looking at for your examples is a, is a good sure. way to put it. You know, where like, sometimes we put some people up on a pedestal that don't necessarily always need to be there because they're not doing it right. We just, they're just there. Yeah. The public discourse, as we know, is driven by the vocal minorities on both sides of the fence, you know, the, the extreme right and the extreme left. So we believe that, Oh, this is, you know, it's very binary. You're either this side or that side. And we know life is not binary. It's very black. It's very shades of gray. And I believe that 80% of rational people can agree on 80% of the things. Like if we sat down and talked about the most controversial issues there are, you know, I know that you're a sharp, rational guy. I mean, we could have discourse and, and likely come to agreement on most things, you know, on most things, even the, the most controversial things that are out there. That doesn't, you know, 
that doesn't get the clicks. That doesn't yeah, get the viewership. That doesn't sell the the, the papers, right? So that's exactly um, what I was going to lead into too. Was because you know we met ten years ago when social media was such a different place than it yeah. is now. It was very nascent, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I'm hoping that it comes back to something that it was. I don't really see that happening, but I'll hold out hope because you have to remember too. We have the ability to turn off the stuff we don't want to see on social media in a way. You know, there's sure. always going to be the algorithm that's yeah. going to drive things, but it doesn't mean I have to pay attention to it, you know, and I feel like I've kind of gone up and down with who I'm following. We're like, nah, uh, you're, you're just too this way for me, or you're too that way for me. And I don't have to follow you or listen to you. I want to learn about topics and I want to grow um, as opposed to, you know, oh, dude, it's pretty cool. You're on Instagram, follow me and I'll follow you back because now we're friends. <laughs> it's, it's a great observation it's a great practice that, that you've put in place there and it's interesting that you say that because you know before we went on air we were talking about the fire that you know that i experienced the czu fire here in, in 2020 where i you know i lost my property my house it's in, in basically 20 years of my life up in smoke completely obliterated up here and um it taught me some extremely valuable lessons uh when when i really reflect on it and it's still super tough you know for me it's just you know it brings up a lot of emotions that i would you know build things i i'd, I'd pour concrete i'd pour cement I, i'd lay you know retaining walls i i'd build things and 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 look at my kids and say okay you know this house is going to be yours. You're not going to have to get into this debt cycle, right? You're not going to have to be a, a wage slave. Like you, this is taken care of. You will always have food growing here on the property. You will always have a place to live. And I put this time, money, effort, you know, uh, emotion into building these things that I assumed had permanence to them, right? And then when that fire came through and hit these structures and got up to, you know, they say 2000 degrees and some of these structures, I mean, it, it melted everything. Like it melted the foundations, it melted the houses, it melted the metal. There was just, all that was left was streams of aluminum, aluminum rivers everywhere. That was it. That was all that was left. And so this assumption that we assigned to that, that certain things in our life have permanence is a fallacy. You know, all material things by definition have a beginning and an end. You know, they, 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 they don't last forever. But what does last forever, the opposite of that, because I was kind of going through that thing. It's like, well, that's kind of a little bit morbid. But, you know, there is a lesson on the flip side. Things that we write off in our lives that, that, we, that we assume don't matter are the most important, are the most important, have the most permanence. I'll give you an example. You cannot unthought. Your thoughts have power. Your thoughts have permanence. You cannot unsay something once you put it out there in the universe. You cannot undo an action once you've taken action. So, you know, thinking negatively about people, putting negative thoughts into the world, getting into scarcity mindset, that cannot be undone. Now you can change the way you're thinking and start putting out different thoughts and different and, and speaking differently moving forward, but you can't change what you've thought, said, or done in the past. They have permanence, they have consequence. So with that, knowing that, we must be very guarded and very, very careful about the inputs that we allow into our mind, because those inputs start to, to dictate the repetitive thoughts of the mind. So if I'm on Fox News every day, all day, all I'm going to be thinking about is what the Fox News talking heads. If I'm an M MSNBC every day, all I'm going to be thinking about is, you know, the evil Republicans and and what the MSNBC talking heads think of say every day. Right. It dominates the repetitive thoughts of our mind. And then, and then that's what we start thinking about. That's the energy we're putting out into the universe. Those are the words that start coming out of our our mouth. And then we act in accordance with that. So being guarded and any time that I find myself in a funk or in some type of a, like negative spiral, I look at my inputs in 100 percent of the time. My inputs have slipped. I started listening to Bloomberg on the way on the way to work instead of a you know a good podcast or something, right? And what's Bloomberg all saying? Oh, you know, financial this and crisis and blah 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 blah. It's the same shit. 
you know, we're always at war with somebody. There's always going to be, you know, some looming this or looming that. And it's just, it's just fear mongering over and over to, to hijack in between the ears, to hijack our minds, which is our most valuable thing that we can possibly have is controlling the mind. I remember when I finished uh, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, right? And his, his experience going through the concentration camps. My biggest takeaway is regardless of the external circumstances, and shit happens, don't get me wrong, shit happens in life, right? That's a reality. Is But we can always control, always control two things, our attitude and our effort, our attitude and our effort, regardless of the external circumstances. And we've been taught through our lives, through the public school system of this law that exists and this law that is a complete fallacy, yet it is ingrained in our DNA being, you know, Americans growing up in the system, this law of cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. It's like second nature. And cause and effect is complete BS when it comes to human beings. If your dad was a was a, a, a abusive alcoholic and my dad was an abusive alcoholic, guess what, Pip? You and I should end up in the exact same place in life due to the law of cause and effect. Well, we know that's not the case. We know for a fact there are multi-billionaires out there whose fathers were abusive alcoholics, and there are addicted, homeless drug addicts whose fathers were, were abusive alcoholics. So the law of cause and effect doesn't apply to humans. What is the true law? Cause plus reaction equals effect. How I react to the external circumstances determines the outcome, not just that the external circumstance happens. Right. So how I react to the, the, those external circumstances. So being guarded about the inputs, understanding that ultimately, regardless of what's happening around me, I have power to change this, change the outcome. And that is the most powerful thing that we can possess as human beings and recognizing that and not being enslaved to this victim mentality that's so pervasive right now. And I think too, with that, that reaction to me is really the key. And, and dude, you just laid down, like, I got notes like galore here for things you said. Like, it was almost like a, a, a masterclass on parenting and what you want to be teaching your kids these days and, and how you can be acting. But, you know, that reaction, I feel like, and, and I'm really working on this with, with my boys now, you know, throughout my life, I reacted as, I don't want to say society wanted me to react to things, but as those around me. So whatever group I was in, I went with that mob mentality that we see as being such a bad thing in life these days when it comes to negative circumstances. And it's such a big thing is how you react. You know, if someone is being negative to you and you respond negatively, the situation is just staying even further in the negative. And sometimes it's not easy to try to flip the script on that negative situation and respond with a positive or something, but it's something that's going to make society better. And it's something that's going to make you better. More importantly is, is how you handle it. And we were just talking about it at work yesterday. Like when I meet people at work, it's usually their emergency is the worst day of their life. And that emergency could be as small as, you know, uh, I'm stuck in an elevator or whatever it is they're having. It's a bad day if they have to see me. If I respond negatively to them because of the way they've responded to me, I'm not doing anything to solve the problem. Uh, there are some instances where that reaction is required, but it's few and far between. And it's all about reaction, reaction to me. And, and that's how we may be able to make change this cycle of, of negativity, I guess, is what, what I'm getting at there. Absolutely. And we all have friends or family members that haven't been conscious of that, haven't made that change. And, and what happens? You know, you have a friend or family member that's that's in this victim spiral. They're literally manifesting the very situation that they're saying they, they, that they want to avoid. You know, oh, the sky is falling. My, you know, my finances suck. Oh, my job's horrible, blah, blah, blah. But all you're doing is is you're putting out and you're creating the very thing and, and I call it the victim spiral because it, none of this is stagnant, right? We're always, you know, motion is the key to life. We're always moving but on a micro and macrocosm. Like motion is the key to life. And I remember my priest told me years ago, he's like, you know, the spiritual journey is 
very much like a salmon swimming upstream to spawn. Like if you stop, if they stop putting in the work, they stop swimming and they just go, okay, I'm in a good place. I'm just going to stop. What happens? The current takes you right back out to the ocean. It's a, it's constant work. We got to constantly be aware and moving forward and, 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 and making decisions that help determine the outcomes that we want in life. Because if we say, okay, I kind of got it figured out and we go passive again, all these inputs are typically not on board with this, this philosophy. You know, the inputs are all very extreme. They're all very negative. They're all very victim oriented because I believe vic victimhood is a modern form of slavery. Like fortunately we don't have people in shackles and in chains anymore. Thank God. You know, but we do have people's minds shackled and chained and they're shackled and chained by you're a victim. You're a victim because Trump got elected. You're a victim because Biden got elected. You're a victim because, you know, of this and that and your 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 boss and your your wife or your your family or your situation or, you know, this you got that. It's like it's all about the external. And if it's only about the external and we and we can't control anything, then we can never improve our situation in life, right? Yeah. Because it's all external. We're, we're just taking it and it is what it is. If we recognize that, hey, I've made a certain set of decisions that got me to where I am right now, sitting in front of my computer at seven in the morning, talking with you has been a result of a lifelong de of decisions that I have made. And if I don't like being right here, sitting with you, talking with you, I can make different decisions and be in a different place. And, you know, going back 12 years ago, you know, when I was bankrupt due, due to, you know, uh, investing in speculative real estate in 2007, everyone who's old enough remembers what happened in 2007, eight, and, and, and in nine, right? And I'm sitting in front of the mirror and, and I've, I've over leveraged everything and I've lost everything that I own. And I'm in my mid, mid 30, early 30s and I should be in the prime of my life. And I'm having a pity party crying in front of the, the bathroom mirror. At some, uh, you know, I, I smacked myself upside the head and said, you got yourself in this situation. No one else, no one forced you to, to over leverage yourself and try to become get rich scheme on real estate. You made that decision. You made that decision. So guess what? If you don't like where you ended up in life, you don't like the outcome, make different decisions. It's that simple. Make different decisions. People don't want to hear that, but it's that simple. Make different decisions, even if, and, and I and I have certain uh, friends and uh, family members that believe that truly believe they've always made the best decision and they've ended up in horrible situations time and time again. So I don't even talk to them and say, make better decisions because they think they're making the best decision. I said, just make different decisions. You know, like if you think something through and you're like, OK, this is the decision I'm going to make. Just make the opposite decision and see what happens. It may just work out you know, because he's past. Yeah, seven. exactly. <laughs> like make different decisions, you know, make different decisions. We, we all have yeah. those folks in our life where you're like, if you just did the opposite thing one time, <laughs> yeah, do the opposite every time. Work, just go the opposite. Just, just give it a try. Like, just yeah. Work. Hey, See what happens? There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but they also too, when you get into that mentality, they don't even see those. It's almost like they forgot how many times they fell down, I guess, or failed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you always try to learn from that. And, and there's just folks that just refuse to learn from those. And, and they don't want to flip the script and make that correct decision or different decision. And addicts, gambling, yeah. right? Uh, gam uh, alcoholics, right? It's like he, cause, reaction, effect. Here's the outcome. Oh, let me just do the exact same thing. You know, smart people or people that, that don't have the, you know, that aren't in this addiction cycle or victim cycle have that experience. Go, wow, I, I this is the outcome. Let me learn from that and tweak, you know, how, how I'm doing things and see if I can get a different reaction. The, the addiction cycle, the victim cycle is just repeating the same thing over and over. It's just on repeat, you know, repeat, I rewind. I for sure in my, my younger years enjoyed gambling probably more than I should have. Um, never to an extent that I, I was ever in a bad financial place from it. But as I got older and had kids and, and I tell the story to people all the time, like, and I was at a casino and I was gambling and I was watching chips leave. I was like watching diapers leave and yeah. a toy I could buy my son. And it wasn't that it was causing me to be financially unstable or, or anything like that. But I was just looking at that money and I'm like, I don't find this as exciting as I used to for some reason, because I can spend this on Finn 
You know, if I don't have sure. it, I can't spend it on Finn. And you see that change and it's like learning from that. We're like, yeah, I'll still go to a casino and, and gamble on something or the Super Bowl or something along those lines. But sure. No way. Am I? You're not that? betting your house on the Super Bowl, right? Exactly. Like, they, you know, that's that's the difference. Yeah. It's like there's there, it's fine to have these, you know, guilty pleasures. I love, you know, some good wine or to throw back a beer on a hot summer day. But I also know that there's a lot of addiction in my family. There's a lot of alcoholism on both sides. So, you know, I'm not going to be throwing back a 12 pack every night after work because I know that's a slippery slope considering, yeah. you know, my background and history and, and, you know, the environmental and genetic factors that exist. So why would I put myself in that situation? I don't. Same thing with gambling. You know, like, yeah, I'll, I go to a Warriors game. I want to throw a hundred bucks on the game to make it even more exciting when I'm there, but I'm not betting sports betting on everything all the time because I know that that's a slippery slope. So we just need to be conscious of the propensities. You know, we have genetic propensities. It's very interesting. If you look at it, they call it like sins of the father. Like if you look at the, if you're a male out there listening to this, and if you look at your genetic, you know, your kind of your male bloodline, you know, what your father's propensities were, what his father's propensities were, a lot of that gets passed down. We need to be very conscious of that so that we can control the environmental factors because it may be easier, easier for us to slip into alcoholism than somebody else or easier for us to slip into gambling addiction than somebody else. So being very conscious, very easier for us to slip into, you know, being a, a fornicator and out there cheating and doing all this thing because you know my dad was a cheater and his dad was like so being conscious of that and and if that's the case i'm not going to go sit in a bar i'm not going to go sit in the casino i'm not going to go you know watch porn or whatever it is like be conscious of whatever your propensities are and control that environment we have power over it we're not powerless even we're not powerless over our genetics i'll tell people that right now it's, it's just like the, the food label or everything. We also didn't know this 30 years ago. You know, when we were growing up, there was very limited information about things like this. It, it, it definitely existed, but it's so much more when we look at that information that we're taking in, we're taking in that these things, just like taking care of your health and wellness, what you're putting in your body, how you're acting, they're all there. It's just, again, yeah. how you react to them, right? That's why it's such an exciting time to be alive right now. I mean, it's like, you know, again, you you plug into the 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 media sources and stuff. The sky is falling, but you know, because I don't plug into that, you know, I watched the sunrise this morning. Just gorgeous, phenomenal, like a just. Wait, that's not a window. To, I thought that was a window behind you the whole time. That's not a window back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm looking out over the Pacific Ocean here. Uh, you know, I just moved back into my place about a month ago after the fire. So it took, you know, three years. It's still a construction zone, but, you know, I'm off grid, all solar, well, septic. And and it's just like, I'm so blessed to be able to, you know, wake up and, and watch a different sunrise every morning or, or the sunset over the ocean and, and just have this spectacular show that's put on just for me, no one else in the whole world has the unique perspective of that moment in time than I do. And being grateful for that, filling out, you know, this five minute journal, the gratitude journal every morning and every night, like, what am I grateful for? Even the littlest things, you know, the, the gratitude begets abundance and abundance begets more abundance in life. You know, whatever we, what, here's the quote from today. They always put a quote in, in every single one. This is amazing. All re, this is George Lucas quote. Always remember your focus determines your reality. Your focus determines your reality. What are we focusing on? Our thoughts become our words. Our words become our actions. Our actions over time equal results. And those results reinforce a belief system and that belief system dictates our thoughts thoughts words actions over time beliefs right and those beliefs you know here is something that you, we we need we as adults need to be really think through what is our foundational belief system because most of us haven't spent enough time thinking about that and that foundational belief system was put into motion when we were little kids, we know from looking at uh, behavioral psychology and, and childhood development, between zero and seven years old, our 
instrumental in the rest of our lives and in, in forming our belief system. For instance, you know, my dad would tell me things when I was a little kid, like, uh, the sky's the limit. Your attitude's your altitude, right? My mom would say things like, money doesn't grow on trees. These are two very different belief systems. They both had great intention. They both had good intention for me. They didn't want to do me harm. They're both loving, and that's super important, and the most important. I, I, but it's it's conflicting thought process. One is an abundance thought process. The other one is very scarcity driven, right? Um, so recognizing that because you know between zero and seven, we're not really making conscious decisions. We're in download mode. We're downloading. We're we're downloading. We're observing. We're testing things out. We're seeing the reaction we get, and we're incorporating to it. So if you had a shitty upbringing between zero and seven, or, or you had a very scarcity upbringing or an abusive upbringing, you know, my heart goes out to you. That's horrible. But recognizing that and saying, okay, this thing that's operating in the background here is not what is not how I want to, 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 to proceed in life. It's, it's kind of screwed up. The CPU here is screwed up. So, um, how do you break that cycle of beliefs, thoughts, words, actions, results, beliefs, right? How do you break that cycle if it's spiraling negatively? As far as I can tell, there's only two ways because you can't just start thinking differently. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to believe something differently without an experience to back it up, right? It's like, oh, I could not believe in God and then have a crazy religious experience. And then all of a sudden my reality changes, but it was due to the experience. It's not just because I just said, oh yeah, I'm just going to change. Now I believe in God when I didn't before, right? Something, there has to be an experience. So there's only two ways to break the cycle. We start talking different. We, you know, we can control the words coming out of our mouth and, or we start acting different, you know? So this whole thing of like, kind of fake it till you make it, it there's reality to that. Like if we, if, if, if I'm going to be very conscious of the words that come out of my mouth and I'm not going to belittle people, I'm not going to speak negatively. And I'm, I'm going to just start for the next, this day today, you know, if someone's struggling with this out there, start today, just one day, have an experiment. Like everything I say is going to be around abundance. I'm going to be positive in how I'm communicating. You know, I'm not going to, Put anyone down. I'm not going to belittle. I'm not going to say anything negative. I'm not going to say the sky is falling. I'm not going to speak negatively about my spouse or my finances or my kids or my situation or my job. I'm always going to look for what can I be thankful for? What can I compliment? Find a legitimate compliment. Find a legitimate thing to be grateful for in that situation and just do that experiment one day and see how it changes how everybody responds to you. See how it changes your attitude, how you sleep better, how you feel better, how you have more energy and then build on that, right? So it's we can change our thoughts or we can change our words and we can change our actions is the, is the takeaway. And, and that's it. It's that recognition of this, right? It's that recognition that the sky isn't falling because the sky has been falling forever. According to some folks, there's always going to be another, a not another day, but the sun yeah. always rises. Right. And I know for me in, in my life and, and with, in my wife's life, like we realized as parents very early on, and probably even before, I think we became parents when we were thinking about becoming parents, you know, we were brought up very differently. Uh, she was overparented. And I was underparented is the easiest way to put these things. Nothing was wrong. We grew up in loving households. We were brought up with religion and, and great. And we had, you know, good family upbringing, but there were differences there. And we were like, we should try to figure out a way to meet in the middle here. Like take a little bit from what they did, take a little bit from what my parents did, and we'll somehow come to the middle. And I think we've done an okay job with it. And, and one of my, uh, Kind of like one of my markers for that we're doing it right is that both my parents and her parents have both said to us in situations with our children, well, that's not how you were brought up. And we're like, yes, you're exactly right. That's not how we were brought up. It's a very good <laughs> point to take you're home. Like winning. <laughs> yeah. Like I must be doing something right because they've noticed we're not doing it the way they did it. Not that they did anything wrong, yeah. but it just wasn't right. Or I shouldn't even say it. Dad, I'm sorry. It wasn't not right. I know you listen. It just it's just not what's right for me right now and for my kids. And I think, you know, now that the kids are older, they understand that and they see it in our children. You know what I mean? And it's just that recognition, like we've been talking about the whole time. You know, the recognition of, of how to be better, you know, whether it's what you're putting into your body, fitness, 
you know, journaling, mental awareness of situations. And it's such a big part of life that I, it's a huge part of my day. I know it's a huge part of your day. I think most parents, uh, I know most parents are doing the best that they can with the knowledge that they have, you know? I look at my upbringing, I had six brothers and sisters, you know, my, my parents did the best they can. It was not perfect, you know, and it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and look back and say, oh, well, you did this and that and blah, 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 blah. It's like, dude, we're all doing the, it, it, it's, none of us have experienced parenting until we're a parent, you know? Until they and, let you take that kid home, which is really scary. Yeah, and, and being a parent and, and, you know, it's like, I'm doing the best I can. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I I hope that it turns out right. And you know, you just hope to to raise kids that 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 have compassion, that have confidence, right? And and approach the world and our energy chargers that are that are that are bringing abundance to the world. You know that that bring joy to people's lives and not and not take away. You know, there's, there's love is abundant. You know, uh, uh, you know, the positivity, the the joy that we could put into the world, there is no limitation to that. I'll give you a, a proof of that. Any parents out there, you could completely love your significant other, your wife, your your husband, completely love them. And as soon as that child is born, you 100% love that child. And it doesn't take away from the love that you have for your parents or your spouse, right? It's abundance. It's abundant. Love is abundant. There's so many things. Energy is abundant. All the wars that have been fought in mo the modern era over are over energy scarcity. Energy is abundant. The tides constantly move. The wind blows. The sun shines. Right? Energy is abundant. We're finally getting to a point to harvest all that in an economic manner. Energy is abundant. There's very few things in life that are truly scarcity. Yet all of the the the, the negativity and this victim stuff really comes from a scarcity mindset. And we need to flip the script on that and say, you know what, scarcity is BS. Like there's abundance all around us. Yeah, there was loads of toilet paper back in the day. We it never it never yeah, yeah, really. we were able to make yeah. it. You know, and even if there wasn't, like you could figure it out. <laughs> there's yeah, you could figure it out. You know, there's there's leave, there's leave. Like what did people do before toilet paper? Like figure it out, you know. You could totally make it work. I I know for a fact you could totally make it work. You know, you you've kind of grazed over this a couple times, and it's just because it's something in my world too. And you know, you you did lose everything to to the fire in 2020. You know, you're, you're not I shouldn't say everything, you lost your house and your neighborhood from that and i didn't know much being an east coast firefighter you know you see things on the news and when you have wildland fires that, that really get into these neighborhoods and things and take houses but recently i was out in redding california and i saw some of the the devastation up there from one of the wildfire wildland fires that had happened a year or two before and it's just such a humongous scale as opposed to what we see here on the East Coast when it comes to a house fire. And it changes a community. And yeah. I don't know, I know you're back where you are, but in your community, is that starting to, to come back? Uh, to 950 homes were lost, and I believe 100 have, have um, either moved back or in the process of moving back. God, which is, was just, yeah. just a humongous number, you know, and that, that's kind of where we were in Reading too, with, I think the same amount, like numbers there that you just can't fathom when you lose these. Yeah. Well, we had a canopy fire. I mean, I had a canopy fire. A lot of Bonnie Dune and Santa Cruz had a tough fire. So that's why you have, oh, this house got lost. This house got saved type of thing. You know, I'm off the grid, of, you know, six acres out here. We had a, a canopy fire. Which means, as you know, you know the the fire got into the top of the canopy, into the treetop. So you had, you know, pine trees and madrones and oaks. Literally, I I was watching from um, before it got to my property. It looked like you were lighting a match, and they just you light a match, and it's like like the entirety of the tree was being consumed in three, four, five seconds. You know, so the amount the heat was so intense. That none of the animals could escape. There were when I got back on the property, there were fully cooked deer, you know, all you know, all over the place. There were there were um, skeletons of squirrels with little nubs all over the place. Like nothing could escape the the intensity of the heat and how fast it was. The fire was actually traveling. So you know when you experience a fire like that, nothing can survive it. It just it levels everything. And then, you know, coming everything. back to that whole, yeah, that that assumed permanence that fallacy of assumed permanence you know it's it's not permanent you know the the earthquake or a fire or you know like 
look at the greatest civilizations uh, uh, throughout history, you know, where, where are they? They're, they're all under the sand or under the dirt getting excavated. They're not around anymore. You know, there is no permanence. So, you know, uh, coming back to uh, controlling, you know, really being conscious of, of thoughts, words, and actions, th those do have permanence and uh, putting more time and attention and effort into those things that really matter versus, you know, the ex the external, the, the stuff that we know is, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now is not going to be around. Yeah, no, it's it definitely one of those, you know, obviously a life changing event for you and your family. And I'm, I'm so stoked that you're back. You know what I mean? You, you went back right into it. And I remember you telling me shortly after, like, we'll be back. It's just going to be a little bit of time. And, you know, once everything gets going and now you're, you're, you're cooking again, you know, chainsaws and tractors. <laughs> you could do a lot. With that. <laughs> Thousand tractors, yeah. You know, and I think too, and and you breezed over this really quickly too. And I know you're a fan of. Uh, I don't. I don't know if you're called a fan, but you go to Burning Man quite often, and it's on my list of things to do. I think it's going to happen after I retire. You know, a couple more years, I'm going to make it out there. But this attitude that you're talking about, you know, about just being there for others and being continually positive and. That's Burning Man, isn't it? Like for the folks out there that don't know or haven't really paid attention to what happens out that that at that festival. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's you know, it's about community. It's it's a different thing at Burning Man. When you meet people at Burning Man for the first time, you 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 meet you embrace them. You meet them with a hug. You know, it's just the way everything's done. You know, there is no uh, I do something for you, you do something for me. It's a gifting economy without without expectation of return, without expectation of return. So you have people that are amazing chefs and artists and and uh, you know providing all kinds of incredible value to the world in, in the form of their different you know products and services out there just giving it, giving it away freely and 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 it all, you know, even though there's no expectation of return it all comes back a hundredfold because that's part of the experience so you know, taking that forward and bringing that out into the world a little bit it just gives you uh, more compassion you know it, it gives you the opportunity to see how things can be and it, it really has changed you know my life and and who I choose to hang out with you know, they say that, you know, you can, you can, you're, we're the sum of the, you know, five people we hang out with the most or something like that. Right. And it's like eliminating people in my life that weren't, that weren't serving me anymore. I don't mean serving me as in servant. I mean, serving me as in were energy drainers that were, you know, that were negative, that, that would suck the life out of the room that, you know, we're in this victim cycle like i'm not a victim of anything not of the fire not of any of uh, anything that i've been through it's all as tony robbins says you know it's all happening for me not to me you know, so why would i uh choose to you know expose myself or be around people that don't align with that philosophy because uh, like i said earlier abundance attracts more abundance you know? and so it's it's helped me refine my friend group and, 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 you know, the, the people that I get to associate with now from at fit aid with the company we've created and the employees we have to, you know, the, the people that, you know, I hang out with and, and play music with and go to festivals. Like we are the tightest group of human beings and we all have each other's back. We all trust each other a, a thousand percent, um, you know, it's, 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 it's special. It, it's so it's great special. You can do that. And, and it's something too yeah. that I think as, as you're younger and less mature, you don't appreciate, but as again, as we're in our mid forties here, I'll still give you the mid forties yeah. moniker like I have right now, but you, you start to see it right where you don't want to have that conversation where you get in the car after being out with some folks and you're like, that took a lot of my energy. Like, I don't yeah. want, I don't, that's not the kind of thing I want. Why? Yeah, yeah like, make a different decision. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. I can totally change what I'm doing and, and who I'm hanging with and, and how we're doing it. And it, it's crazy because I love recording these podcasts because I feel like we've just spent an hour together and we talked about so many different things. But I really think the entire time it's just been that trajectory over velocity, right? That slow as we're getting better and as we're doing this and surrounding ourselves with better people and making better choices and, and trying to be better, everything's just going to get better, which makes no sense, but it does. 
Yeah, let me leave before we depart here with one thing that's been super influential for, for me and, and especially for our company because I've ran everybody at the company through it, uh, who's now become a good friend of mine. Uh, Mark England is his name. You can Google him. He has a course called Procabulary. So he talked about controlling, you know, being mindful of the words that come out of our mouth. You can identify a victim mentality i have found very quickly if people use soft talk and negations in their communication okay negations are i can't i won't i shouldn't right soft talk is might maybe like sort of kind of hey hey aaron you want to come on the podcast on uh, uh yeah i might be on what does that tell you are you going to commit or are you not committing, right? It's soft talk. It's freaking victim talk. I should kind of, I should be able to make it maybe like, what am I committing? I'm not committing anything or, oh, you know, I can't, I won't, I shouldn't. Oh, okay. If What can I do? You know, when will I be there, right? It's all about being affirmative in how we communicate and being very conscious of that has made a massive shift in my life, a massive shift in my life. And I'm super conscious and our company is super conscious about eliminating the use of should, could, would, maybe, sort of, kind of, can't, won't, you know, shouldn't, etc. All these words that I hate that you're saying that I didn't know that's what it was called. Like, I hate it when people say it. I hate it when my kids say that. I'm like, no, we're not yeah. saying that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? yeah. We're not doing it. What do you want to do? Let's yeah. go. Get rid of the soft talk. Get rid of the negations. It will up-level your communication. It will up-level your life. And, and it will up-level how people react to you because of being affirmative and not being, you know, this wishy-washy person that doesn't know you know, what they want, make a freaking decision, stick to it, do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. And it's amazing what happens after that. Well, you scared the shit out of me when you said soft talk, because I thought you were going to say I couldn't curse and I couldn't be loud. And I'm like, oh, we're finally going to be free on this podcast. (laughs) I am just loud. I'm a little guy and I'm really loud. And that's what I do. I'm sorry, (laughs) but I can do that. I can. You've got a great voice for radio too. No, no way. I hate, dude, I hate the sound of my own voice. I hate this. Like when I re-listen to these podcasts, I just hit the like plus 15 button so many times because I'm like, oh, I'm talking again. I don't want to hear myself. No, come on. Sounds great. (laughs) I definitely have a face for radio. I would go with that though. So So listen, man, I finish these podcasts up when we get to this hour mark with just a size up 10. It's 10 quick questions. Usually they're one word answers, but they're not. So we'll see how we go here. Okay. Knock them out. You ready? Yep. All right, man. Beach or mountains? Oh, gosh. Both. Okay. See, I'm going to have to change questions because now everybody's picking both. I Mag- live in the mountains looking at the beach. so <laughs> <laughs> It's probably the only thing. All right. The only thing I'll give the West Coast over the East Coast is that you can live on a mountain and look at the beach. We really can't do that here in yeah. like next to nowhere. So I'll give you guys that. That's it. Everything else is East Coast is the best. Uh, n- night out or night in? night in a good book or a good movie good book cross-country road trip who's your co-pilot my daughter why i gotta ask it says it picks a kid why she has just a go for it attitude she's like yeah let's try that or you know it's just it's just i'm very spontaneous and so um um, as far as just, let's turn off the road here. Let's do that. Well, and, and, and she could be very spontaneous as well. That's awesome, man. Do you make your bed every day? Yes. A million dollars right now, which I don't have, and we don't send anyone, or you go back to 18 with a redo. Oh, 18 with a redo. Easy. <laughs> I mean, I, not that I'm, you know, I'm yeah. great where I, I'm. Matt, but if yeah. I could take my knowledge base and go back to 18, 18 I mean, you're in. all you had to do is, uh, you know, put a hundred bucks into Bitcoin and you <laughs> surpass that million bucks. You, you would not do the 07 uh, um, real estate investing. Yeah, exactly. Well, I would buy real estate and then sell it in 06. <laughs> <laughs> uh, high, highway or back roads? Back roads. Always. I'm a back roads guy. 
I'm like a motorcycle it. rider, so you know, back roads. Bucket list place to visit that you haven't been yet. Ooh, let's see, where have I not been that I really want to go? Um let's go with oh gosh, that's a tough one. Bali. Oh, I want to get there. That's on the list for sure. Yeah. For sure. All right. It's a hard one. Hardest one of all of them here. Number nine. Football or football? <laughs> football. Come on, man. I'm American. <laughs> Best advice you could give to your younger self. I feel like that's been this whole podcast, but what do you yeah. got? <laughs> any, any one last takeaway? Even though he kind of gave a last takeaway, but one last takeaway for him. Chill the fuck out, Aaron. Like Jesus, I my whole life I feel like I've just you know had the pedal to the metal, and 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 it's just recently that I've been able to like stop and enjoy the moment a little bit more. I I was in such a hurry to graduate high school and then graduate college and get a job, and it's like, dude, being a year ahead of schedule doesn't get you anything special, you know. Like it's a it's good to be driven at the same time. You need to be able to control that once in a while and and uh and appreciate you know what you have in life and appreciate the moment and and you know just appreciate all the abundance around us versus always driving for more and whatever more is sweet man that is a great way to end this conversation i cannot thank you enough for joining me here on the size up this week and yeah bro. thanks for having me for everyone out there that that's putting all different kinds of beverages into your system. Make sure to check out a life aid beverage company. Uh, they're in, again, I feel like fitty, the original product is still one of my favorites. However, the recent release of a uh, Hawaiian, is it Hawaiian nectar? Hawaiian right? nectar right Hawaiian behind nectar me. Yep. Right there. It's I'm like, was it Hawaiian night or Hawaiian nectar? I can't remember. Nectar. And <laughs> if you're a firefighter, we do, uh, you know, discounts for, for fire service, um, and, uh, wholesale pricing for firehouses. So, individuals uh make sure you go on the website and is it um not apo that's military what what's the thing uh, id me id me yeah okay yeah id dummy yeah yeah you just basically prove you're you're in the fire service and you get a nice discount which is great as a firefighter i'm sure by this point if you don't know about it you're really not on the internet as a firefighter but id me has some of the biggest companies out there um offering discounts to first responders uh medical yeah. personnel um, all, uh, I think military teachers, teachers, that. teachers yeah, military. Yeah. Yeah. You know, started with military kinda... and then, and then went to police fire from there. And now I think they cover nurses and teachers as well. Yeah. And you're basically just, you know, showing them your ID and, and you're in, it's a simple login. Um, yeah. but it's crazy. We didn't even talk about fit aid's commitment to the fire service and, you know, they've supported five, five, five fitness for so many years, but you know, you've been putting cans of fit aid on the fire lines and, and across the country, you know, especially the wildfire lines, just dropping, uh, pallets of from uh from planes and stuff to the guys out there and, and guys and girls out there fighting wildland fires even prior to to your own experience with that um and i can't thank you enough for that it's a great product to have in your cooler at the firehouse in your uh soda machine that we all still probably have in our firehouses um although you probably have to change the can size i'm not sure how that would work if you have an old school regular can <laughs> might work yeah 12 out we're a 12 ounce sleek not the the traditional kind of fatter can but oh it's called a 12 ounce sleek. sleek i didn't know that so I just it's called yeah. the sleek can industry right. lingo i'm in <laughs> here at the end but again aaron thank you so much for your time man thank you to everyone listening i will catch you next week for the size up by national fire radio this is pip and everybody be safe out there Fire Radio.